All right, so if we've got this uh, multilingual model that we've trained on all these different languages, then you'd expect the vocabulary to be different than the one in English BERT, right? So uh, I created a notebook um, to kind of you know, poke into that vocabulary, see what's in there. And as with all my other notebooks, I'll be using the Hugging Face implementation uh, with PyTorch. So I'll need to, you'll need to install that. I'll put the link to this notebook down in the description. Yeah, and to get at the vocabulary, all we need is the tokenizer. And uh, there's a separate class for the XLMR tokenizer, XLM Roberta tokenizer. Not the, so it's not the BERT tokenizer class. So we'll download that. And then we've got the full vocabulary now. So under the tokenizer, you can call get vocab. And I believe that returns the vocabulary as a dictionary. So we can just get the keys. And that gives us a full list of uh, all the tokens in the vocabulary. So, yeah, so it's got 250,000 tokens plus uh, maybe two special ones or something like that. Now let's close out that table of contents. There we go. It's kind of fun to just dump everything to a file and then open it up and just kind of scroll through it, you know, and, and see what you notice. So let's do that. We're just going to dump it all to vocabulary.txt. You can go over here to pull up the, uh, the files. Pull up vocabulary.txt, close that sidebar again. All right. Yeah, so we've got some special characters here at the beginning. And then it looks like all of the tokens kind of organized by um, frequency. So S is one of the most common subword tokens. And yeah, starting to see some interesting stuff in here. Yeah, definitely different character sets going on. Let's try jumping farther. Yeah, so let me explain. Um, XLMR uses uh, what's called a sentence piece model rather than Bert's word piece model. Um, let me uh, explain that and then it'll probably uh, help with, with understanding all those tokens. Yeah, so essentially with BERT, when we uh, break a word into subwords, and you know, I've, I've kind of forced BERT to break this word by misspelling it, any, any tokens that are subwords of the word are denoted by these two hash symbols. Uh, and they're not like wildcards, they, they just indicate that this token is a subword token. And the first subword in a word, they don't put those, um, those two hash marks on it. So for sentence piece, the, the convention is kind of like the opposite. Um, what sentence piece does that's unique is it actually captures all of the white space explicitly. So with BERT, it breaks words down and you can definitely like reconstitute the words from the BERT tokens, but the spacing between words is a little ambiguous. It's not um, explicitly captured by word piece. So sentence piece captures the spaces explicitly using this underscore character. Um, it's not actually underscore. It's actually this kind of special Unicode character that looks like an underscore. And they call it sentence piece because by explicitly capturing the spaces, you can reconstruct the whole sentence faithfully, not just the individual words faithfully. All right. Yeah, and we can kind of, uh, we can import the BERT tokenizer and you know, tokenize an example sentence and kind of look at how the, the two, two models handle it. Example sentence, XLMR model has many word embeddings. We'll tokenize with both models. Got a little helper function here to kind of just print, print them in two rows. Yeah, so it indicates the first word in a sentence by including a space, which like, you know, if you think about an English sentence, there's always a space following the period. So there really is a space before the first word. Um, and then space XL. And then the lack of an underscore here tells you, you know, to concatenate this one with the previous one. So there's no underscores on these three tokens. So that means concatenate them all together. Uh, space model, space has, space many, space word. And then space on its own, embeddings. Embeddings is broken up into three uh, subwords and then a period with no space in between embeddings and the period. So that's an example where even though that we know kind of as a convention in English that you know the period, there's no space between the last word and the period, 
uh, it's not explicit. Because there's no two hash marks, it's kind of like the start of a new word. So if you were, you know, if you weren't applying some additional intelligence, uh, you would actually, when reconstituting this word piece sentence, you'd put a space in there between the S and the period. So sentence piece handles that more explicitly. So basically, when you when you look at uh, sentence piece tokens, you can just kind of replace the uh, underscore with a space um, as you kind of interpret it. And yeah, when we can see that, you know, whenever there's whenever a, a token is a whole word, that's when they'll prepend the underscore before it. So now that we now that you understand what those underscores are about, are about let's go look back and look at that um, that file again. See if there's anything else interesting in there. Just kind of jump down. Yeah. It's definitely not dominated by English words, right? There's all kinds of uh, different uh, languages and character sets going on in here. <laughs> Blackberry. It's like, yeah, you gotta you gotta hunt for English words in this, right? It's like they're kind of rare. All right, so we can we'll do some more more analysis here in this notebook. Single characters without the underscore. That means they're you know essentially subwords, and they could be used to construct words. Um, so we will just loop through the entire vocabulary. If the length of the token is one character, we'll add it to the list, and then we can count those as well as um, print them out. All right, so out of the 250,000 tokens in the vocabulary, almost 14,000 are single characters. Um, that's much larger than the BERT alphabet, or the, you know, the, uh, the set of characters in BERT. I think that was closer to 1,000. So much larger um, character set. Again, yeah, ranked by popularity <laughs> or, or frequency, which makes sense for the punctuation. Punctuation is always going to be concatenated on or, or you know will most often be concatenated to something else so every time there's an apostrophe or um, a period it'll most likely to appear without a space before it so if you look at some of these they've got this little kind of uh, circle like circle of dots um, and I as I understand it that is to allow for different accent characters to be added all right um, token lengths can kind of uh, take the list of tokens, measure their lengths, do a count plot, see a distribution. Longest token is 16 characters. Looks like fairly normal distribution, kind of a long tail there. Um, I was curious, like, all right, what, like, what is a, what is a 16 character word look like? <laughs> And there you go. I don't know what any of these mean. I did notice earlier, if you run all the way down to the bottom, thrombophlebitis? Thrombo Not sure why that made it into the vocabulary. <laughs> Okay, so we did kind of see just from poking through the vocabulary that, you know, the English words weren't that common, especially given how uh, much English text there probably was in the pre-chaining data. Uh, to kind of quantify that, a trick that I've used in the past is uh, to use this database called WordNet. It's like a graph of English words. It, it kind of captures hard-coded information about their relationships, definitions, things like that. So basically, you can see if a word's in WordNet, then it's it's probably a, a valid English word. So you can uh, use the NLTK toolkit to uh, to access WordNet, and essentially, I'll just go through all of the tokens. Only going to look at whole words, um, and then you can basically just try to look them up in WordNet. If you get something back, then you can assume it's a valid English word. So I'll do that through all the tokens, and. What you get is that there's about 5% of the vocabulary are whole English words. You can grab a random selection of those, and then um, WordNet does include you know, the ability to look up the definition or the definitions of a word. So if there's one that you come across that's kind of weird, you can, you can plug it in there 
Um, yeah, kind of a kind of an unusual term. I'm, you know, I'm really curious now to like understand the uh, procedure for for choosing words for this vocabulary because there's some pretty bizarre stuff. Given that you know that there's such a limited amount of English in there, um, not sure why Masa would make the list. You know. <laughs> All right, we can look at uh, how many whole words there are versus subwords. Looks like it's about 40% subwords and 60% whole words. Look at the length of those subwords, kind of similar distribution of the whole words, but shifted over a little bit. The average for whole words seem to be more like five characters in length. And you can look for misspellings. Uh, the original BERT didn't have misspellings, and it looks like XLMR doesn't have them either. It doesn't even have the correct spelling of the word misspelled, uh, but government correct spellings in there, but not the incorrect one. Same for beginning and separate. Contractions, can't is not in there, but uh, can't without the apostrophe is in there. I'm not sure what to make of that exactly. I've also tried with, uh, with the original bird, I kind of downloaded a, a list of names that I found off the internet. Um, it's got about 20,000, 22,000 names in it. And um, maybe we can get another example out of it. Let's see. Oof, yeah, all right. Interesting names. <laughs> Definitely not a comprehensive list. Um, and we can tally them up. Yeah, so about 1,700 uh, names in the list there. I thought it was kind of interesting to look at uh, numbers in the vocabulary, because I know Bert had a lot of them. And specifically, you know, I'm looking for numbers that are, you know, whole numbers, not just uh, uh, the individual digits. Um, we can use the isDigit function to basically check whether the, the string token is a uh, corresponds to a real number. And then I was curious to see, you know, are there any like really big numbers in there? Anything more than um, a four-digit number? So there are two numbers in there that are longer than four digits. One is just the number 10,000. Kind of makes sense. And then there's this guy. Again, like how did that make it into the vocabulary? <laughs> So there's 752 numbers. You can pick out some random ones to look at. Uh, years were very common in the in the numbers in BERT. Um, kind of cool to see that there's there's numbers here in other scripts too. Um, yeah, and I mentioned dates were pretty common in BERT. Um, so I looked at you know the range. I noticed that it seemed to be a lot of the dates between the year 1600 and you know today. Um, BERT had Almost all of these, uh, it looks like XLMR has you know less than half, but still a lot of years in there as well. Cool. So yeah, that's it's fun to poke around there, see see what's in there. Um, let's actually apply XLMR now to an application and you know see how it works. <laughs>